Hello, my name is Shriya Nyopane and I work with the Transnational NGO Initiative at the Maxwell School. Joining me today is Jonathan Jennings. Jonathan is the G Deputy Executive Director of MSF Canada, also known as Doctors Without Borders. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jonathan. Thank you, Shriya. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions uh, to ask you today for students who are interested in pursuing a career similar to yours okay. um, at organizations like MSF. And my first question is, as Deputy Executive Director of MSF Canada, what exactly is it that you do and what does a typical work day look like for you? Okay. Well, there isn't a typical work day, actually within Doctors Without Borders, whether you're a deputy executive director or you're a project coordinator in field level. But, I mean, roughly speaking, I'm partnered with our executive director, executive director to help him oversee the uh, financial, reputational, and operational health of, of Doctors Without Borders in Canada. Okay, so broadly put, that's what I do. Um, I work with a team of five or six senior leaders. These are the directors of our department. Um, I work beside them in, in developing the organization's annual planning, the monitoring evaluation uh, that we apply within that planning. Mm -hmm. So that demands um, that we understand uh, the, the, the visions laid out in our strategic plan, a five-year document, a five-year plan, um, and ensure that each annual plan is marshaled towards the achievement of the broader vision and broader goals that are, that are in the strategic plan. That's one thing that I do. Um, another, another thing that I do is uh, act as a spokesperson for MSF Canada. Uh, our executive director is chief spokesperson, uh, but often there's a lot of interest in MSF's position. Mm -hmm. So together with him and, and other colleagues in the office, I will uh, speak to national media about Ebola or about humanitarian affairs uh, like Ebola that, that, that are concerning MSF or that are where, where MSF is implicated. Um, and I will attend conferences and give lectures. I will uh, meet and greet donors, major donors, uh, minor donors, if, if such a thing exists. All of our donors are major. Um, so that's another uh, area of my work. And then I'm also uh, developing partnerships with our MSF cousins uh, in other offices. So as a movement, we are 24 MSF offices. So we are bringing uh, operational support to our operational centers. And so I work at a strategic level with my counterparts in the operational centers in Europe um, to identify uh, key dossiers where MSF Canada expertise can bring added value to the operational response uh, of the operational centers of MSF. That was a lot of jargon. Is there, would you like to ask a follow-up? <laughs> uh, so when you talk about the operational centers, it, are there certain operational centers that um, MSF Canada is responsible for, or do you provide support across all centers? Okay. So the, the MSF movement is made up of 24 offices. Mm -hmm. Only five of them are operational. So at, okay. at project level, only five MSF headquarters are directly responsible for the management of those field operations. Okay, and those, are found, those offices are found in Paris, Switzerland, Brussels, Amsterdam, and Barcelona. All of the other offices, like Canada, Tokyo, Sydney, we're called partner sections. Okay, so what do partner sections do? We send uh, people to our operations. So in Canada, we send about 300 Canadians every year to the, to the field projects, doctors, midwives, nurses, logisticians, Watson, experts. Uh, we raise money from the Canadian public that we send to our social mission, to our operational centers, and then we uh, supply operational support in the form of innovation uh, or, or, or um, uh, partnership around certain projects. Like in Canada, we have a telemedicine service delivery expertise that we're building. We have an expertise around digital learning that we're building in, in Canada and, and, and service the operations of MSF with these two uh, dossiers. Um, as the leader of a successful international organization like MSF, what do you consider are the key factors to successfully running an INGO? Uh, accountability to donors, an engagement with your supporters that ensures they understand the challenges that you're facing in overcoming the huge hurdles that exist in 
in providing humanitarian aid, mm -hmm. an honest conversation with those supporters, an honest two-way conversation. MSF is a deeply imperfect organization. Uh, we struggle to meet the needs. Uh, we succeed a lot, but we also fail. And so every non-governmental organization should prioritize that honesty, that transparency around its success and failures um, with its supporters. Um, and I think that's, that's essential. Um, what else does it take to, to run a, a large, successful international NGO? I think, um, I think leadership skills. Mm -hmm. uh, MSF is comprised of a lot of highly motivated, opinionated people, and they are all, almost, leaders, regardless of where they are in the organization. Headquarters, field project, and everything in between. Mm -hmm. As a leader, or as a decision maker, you have to create space for these people to thrive. You have to create the space for them to excel, for them to try and fail, for them to try again and succeed. Now that's true whether or not you're talking about a finance director in Canada or a medical team leader in uh, Lear, South Sudan. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's incumbent on every decision maker in the organization to build leaders around them. So every leader which, and I mean by definition of their job title and their role, certain people are leaders, are decision takers, mm -hmm. but all of the people that are around them um, should have the opportunity to build themselves into leaders. I think that's the second key, key element. And the third I would say is a dogged and voracious understanding and dedication to the social mission and to the patients in MSF's case and to the patients that we serve. Um, I think whatever the international NGO is, a drive, a commitment to that social mission, um, to ensuring that every resource within the organization is as sharply and efficiently and as optimally honed towards and, and aimed at delivering and impacting that social mission. Um, and finally, what advice would you give to students who wish to pursue a career in the INGO sector? Um, and especially, what types of values and skills do you think they should try to develop during their time here at Maxwell? I think, I think we should all understand why we want to do nonprofit work. We should all understand why social change is important. Um, I would hope that it's not, though development and humanitarianism exist inside of an industry, a very professionalized industry today. I would hope that people would understand that that cross-cultural exchange is at the root of it. You know, hundreds of years ago when, when you know, humanitarianism has existed as long as this species practically has existed. But I think understanding why you want to dedicate your life to a not-for-profit social change endeavor is important. Um, I would I would probably suggest folks volunteer in their local communities. Um, there are plenty of, of social changes that are needed to be made right outside of our doors here in, in Syracuse. There's plenty of added value that the energy in, in this Maxwell program can contribute locally. Mm -hmm. um, I also think volunteering. I volunteered for a couple of years in Kosovo back in uh, you know 2000. Um, I don't know anymore because the industry has become so professionalized. Mm -hmm. um, look at DevNet, look at Relief Web for the last decade or more. It seems that every project coordinator job or even every entry position demands a master's degree and field experience, which is a bit of a conundrum because how do you, how do, you do that? Nevertheless, I, th I think that you, you need to volunteer, mm -hmm. not only to build your uh, CV, for lack of a better word, but also to build your character. Um, I think there's an importance in, in that. Um, and then I think that cultural exchange, I mean, understanding that learning a language is essential, you know, having tea in local markets, not moving around separated from the, the people that you're there to, you know, quote unquote, work with or serve, regardless of whether you're with a humanitarian 
or a development organization or a private uh, entity that's you know, involved in development or humanitarian work. Um, I really think empathy for the other here is a key. Um, an empathy for the other that it doesn't, you know, doesn't matter who the other is, what color they are, what, what ethnicity, what, what religion they practice. You know, I think, I think uh, as, speaking as a humanitarian, that empathy for the other is, is a, certainly a driving force um, and should be. And I think, I think these are some of the, I think, core maybe elements, at least of my experience, um, that I would like to see embodied in the new generation or the next generation of professionals that come to my organization. Um, you know, I would like to see people come to Doctors Without Borders and say, I'm so dedicated to your social mission and what you do, I don't care where you send me. Now, we're not gonna send certain people into certain places because of the risks mm -hmm. and for security reasons, but just that desire to go anywhere that the organization needs you to go, um, I think is important. Um, that's all the questions we have for you today, Jonathan. Thank you again for taking the time to talk to us. And I'm sure that um, our students will find your responses to these questions extremely valuable. Well, I hope so. Thank you so much, Shreya. Thank you. Thanks a lot.